Hi guys, in the last video, we talked about a little bit of the background of the Enlightenment. Now we're going to go into how it actually connects with government and the founding fathers of America. And that we still have discussions and arguments and apply these ideas today on questions like, what is the root of human nature? Like, who are we? Uh, what is justice? The ideas that go back to the ancient Greeks like Socrates and Plato. What is justice? What are rights? And we're going to start from uh, probably the guy that's most influential when it comes to the Enlightenment in America. His name's John Locke. And right before we go into that, I just want to make sure we're clear on the social science aspect of the Enlightenment. So you have to understand at the time of the Enlightenment, uh, this new idea of social sciences starts to really develop, or the study of people in society, starting to question, and we're starting to apply this in the political science which is a study of people in government, our leadership. So political science is the study of people in leadership and how people react and interact with that leadership in government. So things like different forms of government, factions or groups that are pushing on government, and uh, law and legality is also you can get a, you guys could study, get a major in, in law, become an attorney itself. But political scientists kind of study patterns and trends of voting and uh, political participation. So social science is the big umbrella term. And now we're breaking it more specifically. We're looking at well, what, under enlightenment, well, what, how do we study government? Well, you have to understand the, found, the founding fathers are very much influenced by these enlightenment philosophers like Locke. And we'll, we'll learn about Voltaire and, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, and what we see is that the social scientists started criticizing. So these Enlightenment philosophers at the time that were in the social science start really criticizing the, eco the economic systems and especially the government forms at the time. Because we know that the main government form was a monarchy or the king or emperor was the absolute ruler. Uh, but how, however we saw Thomas Hobbes, for example, thought that people really are nasty and competitive and that's our nature. And maybe we do need an absolute monarchy or we need a strong ruler. That's one argument. We're going to lock. I don't know if he's going to buy that as much. Um, feudalism was a system they had at the time in Europe. Uh, and you guys also see that in Asia and, and Africa as well. But feudalism is when the government, the people are serfs, are controlled by a hierarchy. So you have kings and dukes and lords and duchesses. And it goes down to the serfs. Are, the, the lord is responsible for the for the, the duke is responsible for the lords, and the lords are responsible for the serfs, and everything's this hierarchy, and it's all supported by God. This is God's will through the king, and he's the ultimate re representative or queen of God on earth. That is going to get turned upside down by the Enlightenment philosophers. They're going to start challenging this, and John Locke is really going to challenge this. He's really going to go after uh, Thomas Hobbes as well. So one of his famous books is uh, his most influential books, and you should read it. I've checked it out. It's really interesting. It's called uh, Essays in Human Understanding. In Essays in Human Understanding, he starts to make this argument uh, of uh, tubula rasa. And tubula rasa is this idea, which is Latin for essentially black, blank slate or white slate, like a slate, a white slate or a clear slate is this theory idea that everyone was born into a certain view of the world uh, without any kind of certain view of the world. That you're basically a, like a chalkboard. There's nothing on you, or the whiteboard. And as people start writing on your chalkboard and start writing on your board, that shapes your worldview and who you are. So things like language are incredibly important. If you're buying into John Locke's argument that we're blank slates, the tabla rasa, that we are, in fact, born with no knowledge of the world at all, and everything is shaped in our consciousness and our understanding of things is by every everything from our parents to our culture, like what sports we play. Like it's not a coincidence that the Canadians are really good at hockey. That's a big part of their culture. Or in the South, you play football. I mean, that is church to many people in the South. You go to church twice a week, Friday nights at high school football games, and then Sunday you actually go to a religious church. That's a part of their culture. That's how you grow up. That's your the way you're raised. And that writes who you're going to be in a lot of ways. And his argument is basically it shapes almost all of who you are. I mean, there are some genetic 
and um, characteristics of you. It's things that are traits that are being passed down in science to your parents, but that's overpowered by the environment. A person's blank slate would be shaped by their experience and their sense of perception. So how you perceive things, so your bias, your unconscious bias, we've talked about in the past, like what you learn, like concepts, for example, we talked about in history, like race is a social construct. But you think from that framework, you use those terms, and you think like that because it's been written on your slate. It is very hard for Americans that have been raised in America to not be conscious of the idea of race. And, and social scientists have done studies on this, that even people that come to America from other countries, that one of the, the, the first things they really pick up on culturally is the power of this idea of racial groups and how they play out in America and how certain groups are seen and there's generalizations or stereotypes about certain groups. And nobody's sitting them down and teachers aren't sitting there giving a class on it. They're learning it through messages, through media, and the way people talk and their environment. So the big question in John Locke, uh, with John Locke is, do you think our environment is the most powerful aspect of who we are? Now, this is, a, this is an age-old debate since Locke, really, where, and even the ancient Greeks talked about this, is it our genes and our genetics that make us who we are, or is it our environment that makes us who we are? And we're going to actually uh, do a little debate on this in class. But my question to you is, or is it in the middle? Is it, is it a perfect 50-50? I don't know. I'm a social scientist, so maybe I'm biased that it's probably a little bit more on the environment or environmental side. Like, I think language might be a little bit more powerful. But a scientist, on the other hand, might be, no, 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 no. It, maybe it has to do a lot more with your genetics. Like, if you don't have the genes, it's not going to happen anyway. So, for example, alcoholism. Uh, if you have the gene to be an alcoholic, and you're more likely to be an alcoholic... Uh, if you drink alcohol, you're much more, the probability is really going to increase scientifically that you become an alcoholic versus somebody that doesn't have that gene. But maybe on the, on the social science side of it is, well, yeah, but the fact that all alcohol is acceptable in a, certain cultures over other cultures might really vary the amount of alcoholism. So like in some cultures, you don't drink a lot of alcohol. It's not acceptable or it's taboo, which could actually could cause other issues. Like people drink in excess in that culture. But also, it could, there could be many people that potentially could be alcoholics that are never exposed to the, uh, the alcohol itself. So I don't know the answer, but this is an age-old debate, and I think you're really going to continue it in college and in life. Like, what combination of our genetics and our genes make us who we are, and then what combination of our environment make us who we are? And there's a lot of arguments. As a social scientist, I would argue analytics is pretty powerful. Like, if I've got your information and we use it as social scientists and we give it to companies to advertise to you guys, can we really change your behavior? And there's pretty strong evidence we really can. We can change people's behavior. All right, so let's keep going. We're going to look at uh, another, uh, really, his treaty that he writes is the Second Treaty of Civil Government. This is where he really focuses in on government. And he argues that no one can be subjugated to the political power of another without your own consent. Okay, so this is very influential, especially on the Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and this really builds on this idea we're going to learn of the social contract. So what he's implying that Thomas Jefferson picks up on in the Declaration of Independence is if the government is subjugating, which is overpowering you or, or in control of you in political terms, like a king, and they're not treating you right, you have the right to maybe rebel or fight against them. And this is influential in America because we fight against the British and we declare our independence from the British in the Declaration of Independence. But also you can see on the top left-hand corner picture, the French as well. The French fought a bloody, violent uh, revolution where they killed basically the, des the descendants of Louis XIV and even cut off heads of Mary Antoinette and all this. And I've seen the palace. They ripped the gold out of the palace of Versailles, took all this stuff because they're starving. And the government had spent, the king had spent so much money on these fancy palaces and stuff. And they said, no, 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 you can't do this. You can't spend our money on palaces while we're starving. And, and we don't even have enough bread to eat. Now, all the, most of the Enlightenment philosophers, and Locke really pushes the idea of rationalism. And this is very popular in social science and science today. It's this idea that we should use the scientific method and reason and logic 
we should apply that to the physical world. So that's how we get your scientific method and we test things and that's how we should base that we're getting closer to truth. Doesn't mean it is truth. Science and social science, we're trying to get closer to the truth. That's our ultimate goal. However, it doesn't mean we're there yet, okay? And Locke says you should apply this to the social world. He says, hey, you can apply re uh, rationale, rationalism or reason and logic and research to the social world. Now, the problem at the time in the 1600s, 1700s, while this is becoming popular, they couldn't do an MRI on your brain. Now we can. I can see. We can see that parts of your brain and actually glow. Uh, if we ask you certain questions or if we show you imagery, we can test if you're biased or you're unbiased. And we can set things up much more logically now. But back then, he's really the, 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 the guy that's starting it all uh, in a lot of ways and saying, no, 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 no. It's not just science. It's not just physics. We can actually use a scientific method in social science. And obviously, you know, I agree because I'm looking at political polls and people say, well, yeah, but the polls will be off. We don't know who's going to win the election. We get pretty close, and we have what's called a margin of error. And I think when we get the polls, you're going to be blown away. So we could pretty much tell you who's going to win an election within five five points. The problem is people don't understand how polls win. So let's say, for example, Joe Biden has got 45% of Pennsylvania, and Donald Trump has got 45% uh, of Pennsylvania, and it looks like a dead tie. Well, it could go five points either way. So Biden could actually get 50% and then Trump could go down to 40% or vice versa. So the truth is we just don't know who's going to win that state right now. But we do know how close it is and that those polls are so accurate. It's not a coincidence that President Trump or uh, Vice President Biden will sit there and fight it out to win these elections because they know exactly what the social science and the political science is. And we do use that data and people do give us good data if we do good research and use rationalism. Now, the next argument he really makes is we have these natural rights, okay? So he says that we should form governments based on logic and reason and rationalism. And the founding fathers are buying this. They really are. They want to create a constitution and a government based on this. But also we have natural rights. And we've talked about what is a right. This is what he argues a right is. And I think it's funny if you get the, the picture on the top right. That's John Locke uh, from Lost. Have you ever seen the show Lost? One of the characters' name is John Locke, and he's kind of like the philosopher of the group. It's really cool. So Locke also shapes his idea of humans having natural rights, or rights that we're all born with. He says, no, no, no. There's Some things are non-negotiable. Like, you're born with these rights, period, as soon as you come out of the womb. Now, we could argue all day long about, you know, do you have a right to own guns? And some people say, no, no, it's a privilege. Two-year-olds can't own a gun. But he's going to say these things are actually for sure and this is the foundation of the idea of rights as we know it today. Rights really hadn't existed before Locke. The, the king had all the power, and people didn't have rights. You didn't have individual rights, and you didn't have social rights. You, you just were do what the king told you, uh, or, this, or the lord, or wherever you were in the social order of things. Now, he believed that all humans were born with life, liberty, and property. Those are the three things. Not to be confused with what Thomas Jefferson does. Jefferson changes this, okay? But life, meaning nobody can take your life. They can't take you, kill you. That's your right to be alive. And then that can be interpreted many other ways as we do now. Like, could it be torture is affecting your life? Okay. Liberty. Now, liberty is this concept that we talked about where I can do whatever I want as long as my, my liberty doesn't infringe on others. Okay. So freedom and liberty are not the same thing. So watch out when a politician or somebody in politics, they like to use sensational language. They know what they're doing. They understand the difference between freedom and liberty most of the time. And they're arguing, hey, you're free. This is America. We're free not to wear masks. We don't have to wear masks. That's our freedom. Well, that's the question. Is that a freedom or is that a liberty issue? Because wearing a mask protects other people from you spreading uh, COVID-19 when you're in the pandemic, right? So is it a liberty issue if you're walking around in a mask? Because I have to go in public and buy things. There are times where I just have to go to the store and have to get things. And if people aren't wearing masks, I feel like they're infringing on my liberty to be safe. So we now some things might just be, well, that's not they're not as complicated, like riding a bike. I don't I don't know. People are gonna argue we really need like an age restriction on riding a bike. People would say it's probably not a good idea to teach a one-year-old to ride a bike, but there's one-year-old bikes with wheels, so why not? Um, however, 
Driving a car on the other side is a very much a liberty issue because you could quickly turn that car into a 6,000 pound weapon and you could run somebody over or kill someone. And there's no coming back from that. You have to live the, that the rest of your life. And you infringed on their rights to just cross the street or their rights to drive a car and bring their kids home from work or something, uh, our school. So we, these, we've talked about these. It's very complicated on what these issues are. But he says we have a right to liberty. You can argue on that. And the final one he says is property. So he, he says you have this idea you could own personal property. Um, and that plays out a lot in our Constitution because we think of things like you have to have a search warrant to go into our property. That's kind of the, the line in America today. And the Enlightenment philosophers are supporting this idea of owning property. Um, so if I have a house, the police can't, boom, kick the door open and just come on in. They have to have a warrant. Where uh, if I'm on the street, we're going to find out they just need probable cause. It's not the same. Or if I'm in my car, I'm in my property, they need a warrant to search my car. Where if I'm just, you know, I'm at the mall, they can stop and search me uh, if they have probable cause. And we'll go into that. But he says that you own property and you have a right to own property. That's going to get changed. Thomas Jefferson definitely changes that. He writes in the Declaration of Independence. And Jefferson argues that King George was not honoring Americans' natural rights. He also argues that from Locke's Second Treaty uh, that, hey, of government, that you guys are also mistreating us because you're, you're representing us without, we're, we have no representation and you're taxing the heck out of us. So we have a right to rebel. And he's stealing these ideas directly from John Locke. In fact, John Locke wrote Virginia's Constitution, most of it, early on in the colonies. That's how profound he was and prolific he was in American Enlightenment thinking and really changed our government and influenced us. All men are created equal and have the right to it. Now, Jefferson tweaks it. He says, life, yes, liberty, and we can argue about what liberties those are. People argue every day on what liberties you should or shouldn't have. And then the pursuit of happiness. He says, look, we can't guarantee property to people, but we got to give them the, the pursuit of happiness. Now, I want you to think about some things that might help you pursue happiness. Obviously, I'm going to argue education. So you might have different arguments, but I'm going to argue you should give everybody public education Give them the opportunity to pursue happiness. Now, if somebody doesn't want to do their schoolwork or somebody doesn't want to take school serious, and maybe that school is not for them. Maybe they want to do hands-on stuff or they want to go to a different type of school. I understand that, but we have to give them the option. And we should give them all good quality education so that everybody has a chance. So if you want to be president of the United States and you work hard, you could get educated enough to have that opportunity. Now, you're going to have to do it on your own, I would argue, However, we have to give you the tools to get there, and that's my job as a teacher. Now, Locke also emphasized this idea of separation of church and state, and this is very important. We're going to really get into this with Voltaire. Voltaire does it. He takes this from Voltaire. Voltaire really is into this. He, he argues that we need to, while Locke believes in God, um, He's very much critical of religion, and he's a deist. And we'll get into that with Voltaire, who's kind of the guy on that. But he says, look, you have to keep the, the church and religions out of this new government and all governments, okay? He says, if you have a Christian government, then they're going to maybe suppress other groups, like Muslims or Jewish people or agnostics, which are people that don't know if there's a God or not, or atheists, people that believe there is no God. So he says you got to keep these two things separate. But also, it's a two-way street, meaning the government needs to stay out of religion. So governments can't persecute people because they're religious. And there's been many religions like Jewish people and Jehovah Witnesses that have been persecuted over the years by many governments because they're kind of a, a, a small minority or an easy group to scapegoat for everything. Like, oh, that group did it. You know, just like the Nazis. Um, but he says you got to stay away from them and let them do their thing. But at the same time, you can't have that as the driving force of running a government because then it becomes biased towards one religion. I like this quote at the top. It says, new opinions are always sus suspected and usually opposed without any reason, but because they are not already common. So he says, just because something's a new idea and you're creative, it doesn't mean that automatically most people are be like, you're crazy. You're out of there, right? We've talked about like Martin Luther King was considered an extremist at his time. Or Frederick Douglass was way out of his way, right? He was total human rights for women and everything. He was way ahead of his time. 
Now he's just an amazing person we admire. But back then, he, we had these new ideas that were just ridiculous to people. Okay. So remember, separation of church means the government should not regulate or watch over religions. That's on the religious side. And religion should have no influence on the government's running of the nation itself. Okay? And I just wanted to show you this uh, quick video to kind of help you. It's fun with the Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson. So that was Benjamin Franklin, and obviously that was Thomas Jefferson rocking out. Those are the guys that wrote the Declaration of Independence, and they were talking to King George, the leader of England at the time. All right, guys, have a great week.